How much time does our world have? History is littered with man's failed attempts for utopia on Earth. Kingdoms crumble and empires evaporate. What is the destiny of man? How can one find personal peace? Can we know the future? Yes, we can. Throughout the scriptures, God has sent messages of hope to help us recognize our place in time and prepare for the future. Join us now as Amazing Facts presents Millennium of Prophecy with Doug Batchelor. Good evening, friends, and welcome to another wonderful evening in New York City here at the Manhattan Center. And we're so glad that you have made time tonight to not miss this vitally important topic entitled The Tale of Two Women. Let's bow together. Gracious Father in heaven, we are so filled with joy when we know that we are the apple of your eye. We know that you came to die that we might have life and have it more abundantly. And that you rose again that you will give to us the wonderful blessing of eternal life. And now we have a promise that we are holding on to that you will come again that where we will be, you will also be with us. You will come to take us to that place that you have gone to prepare for us, and our hearts are excited about that good news. So tonight, send your Holy Spirit to strengthen our minds and our understanding, and may we be filled with a desire to love you and serve you better, and may we love each other better also. So we turn this entire meeting over to you now, and may you be praised. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Join with me as we welcome our speaker this evening, Pastor Doug Batchelor. Good evening. Welcome, those of you who are watching, to the Millennium of Prophecy program. And I want to welcome our friends who are here in New York City who have been studying God's Word with us. Well, we're building up steam now as we are making our way into some of the crucial prophecies of Daniel and Revelation. I'd like to bring Mrs. Batchelor out. We'll see if we can touch on a handful of Bible questions before our question time is up. We have some special music tonight, and I think you're going to enjoy the program. All right, are you ready for our Let's our see how much we can cover. All right. Can Satan read our thoughts? No, uh, not any better than you can read mine. Well, I do pretty good sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> what I mean by that is, the Bible and says... And so does Satan, doesn't he? That's knows right. By what our the devil behaviors. can do is he can do, and his demons can do some calculated guessing. The devil can put things in your mind. How many of you know that? But all he can do is look at your body language and expression to see if he's getting through. The Bible tells us God and God only knows the thoughts of men's hearts. And I believe that's 1 Kings chapter 8. I think it's 39. It's the dedication prayer of Solomon. You can look that up. But only God has the ability to look in people's hearts. Did Jesus know how to read the minds of people? Could he tell yes. what they were thinking? You read how many times in the gospel it says Christ knew what they were thinking. He knew what was in man, John tells us. And so he is God the Son. Did you cut that off? Go ahead, yeah. You did? No, I didn't. Okay. Let's, let's ask that. Does God the Father come with Jesus at the second coming? Several people have seen the slides we show of the second coming of Jesus. And remember I told you, uh, give us a little slack on the slides. They're artist conceptions. And they say, isn't God the Father coming with Jesus? We always see just Jesus. Yes, he is. You remember when Christ, being tried by Caiaphas, he said, I adjure thee by the living God, you tell us if you are the Christ. And Jesus said to him, Hereafter thou shalt see the Son of Man coming on the right hand of power. Well, what do you think that source of power and glory is on the right hand? Christ will sit at the right hand of the Father when he comes. That's his position of approval. So yes, God the Father and the Son are coming together, and the Spirit, no doubt, but the Spirit's everywhere. So yes, the Father is coming. Is interracial marriage wrong? It might be. Listen. The Bible says, God hath made all nations of one blood. That means we're all related, okay? We're all family. One time in the Old Testament, Miriam and Aaron gave Moses a hard time because he had married an Ethiopian. And the Lord cursed Aaron and Miriam for doing that. So he was blessing the marriage of Moses. Now, when I said it might be, when you marry anybody... The Bible says, do not be unequally yoked. Unequally yoked does not always necessarily mean race. It might mean culture. 
I know, for instance, where we're from in Northern California, we pastor a multi-ethnic church, and in Northern California and San Francisco, every stripe and type of humanity is represented, and people don't even blink at interracial marriages. You go to South Africa, you may have a problem, and you need to calculate the culture you're in because you may have children in that relationship, and it can make things very difficult for them. So you need to just go into it with your eyes open, recognize the society you're in and what the reactions might be. But biblically, there's no command not to marry somebody out of, the, uh, of a different race. You're not to marry someone of a different faith. Amen? You should not be yoked with someone who believes differently. How long were Adam and Eve in the garden before they sinned? People want to know how long did Adam and Eve enjoy their honeymoon in paradise before the devil showed up and messed things up. Uh, the Bible is not specific. We can calculate it was not very long, obviously less than a year, probably a few months. The reason I say that is because one of the last things the Lord told Adam and Eve was to be fruitful and multiply. They had not yet multiplied. They hadn't had any children yet. So it probably was not very long, uh, less than a year, maybe more than a, a few weeks, but uh, they didn't get to enjoy paradise very long. What does it mean when it says that the worm dieth not? All right, you remember where Jesus said, uh, better to be cast into, or better to go into heaven, missing an eye, a hand, or a foot. You realize these are metaphors. Nobody in heaven is going to be missing an eye, a hand, or a foot. But he said, better to go into heaven missing one of your members than to be cast into Gehenna whole, where the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. There was a valley of Hinnom outside of Jerusalem. It was a steep, rocky valley. It wasn't suitable for farming or building. It was the dump. And they tossed their garbage in there and the carcasses of unclean animals they could, that were not uh, for sacrifice in there. It was full of, of worms. They tried to burn it every now and then to keep the gas and the stench down. And that's what Christ said, the fire that uh, is not quenched and the worm that does not die. Nobody ever put the fire out in Gehenna. They wanted it to burn. See what I'm saying? And so it's a description of the, where the lost go. It's a dump. And it's not saying that there's going to be worms forever and ever in the new earth. Okay. Okay. Do we know that the days of creation were actual 24-hour days? I believe we do. The Bible says the evening and the morning were the first day. The only reason a person would ever question if they were literal days is because they've been listening to the evolutionists come up with their theories about dating. Uh, I used to be an evolutionist. When I grew up in this city, I wanted to be a paleontologist. I believed in evolution thoroughly. After I got away from um, this environment and I was living up in the mountains, uh, I was surrounded by the things God made. I saw evidence of a catastrophic flood in the mountains where I live. In New Mexico, 7,000 feet above sea level, there were seashells everywhere. Hmm. And I thought, you know, I wonder if maybe the dating methods are flawed. I studied into the carbon-14 radioisotope dating they use. That's the foundation for all evolution. Are you aware of that? The dating is the foundation for the whole thing. It is so unreliable. Look up the dating method in your encyclopedia, and you know the one thing they all agree on is it's not dependable. Now, the Bible tells us God made the vegetation on the third day. If it was something more than a 24-hour day, he doesn't make the sun, moon, and stars until the fourth day. A vegetation wouldn't have lasted a thousand years without the sun, moon, and stars, right? So obviously, they were literal 24-hour days. The, the text, if you read it as it's written, there's no reason to question that. All right, for our last question. And my God's big enough to make the whole world in one day. Amen. I mean, so six days is nothing for him. He took his time. All right. If God rejects those that break his commandments, why does he still work in the lives of those Christians that worship and keep Sabbath on Sunday? Well, you know, the Lord is good. The Bible says he's long-suffering to us. We're not willing that any should perish. Jesus said that God sends the rain on the just and the unjust. He's a God of love. And if the Lord was to strike us with lightning each time we disobeyed, we'd all be burnt right now. Am I right? Amen. So you being here right now is evidence of God's patience and love and blessing. But because you go to church on Wednesday for prayer meeting or Sunday or Sabbath and you get a blessing, it's not evidence that you're supposed to keep a certain day. You keep the day because God commands it. Amen? Amen? Would you like to hear an amazing fact? The man's name was Mejilo Totolos. He was a monk who died in 1938. 
He lived in a monastery on top of Mount Athos in Greece, he lived to the age of 82, and in his entire life, he never saw the form or heard the voice of a woman. He was part of a monastic order that uh, did not uh, admit any women to the monastery, and for 900 years, they'd maintained that creed. And Mihilo, Mihilo never once saw a woman. They didn't even have female animals allowed inside the walls of the monastery. Now, the Bible says it's not good for a man to be alone. Of course, the Bible also says that if a man marries the wrong woman, it's better to live in a leaky attic than to be married with a contentious wife. You've heard that one, too. Tonight, we're going to try and find out who the right woman is. That's our study, and that's our historical tonight, dealing with the story of King Solomon and his wisdom in making a difficult judgment call. You remember, no doubt, that when uh, Solomon first received the kingdom, he asked God for wisdom. And that wisdom was evident, especially in the judgments he rendered. There was one specifically difficult case of two women who lived together in a home. They both had baby boys about the same time. And while the children were infants, one of the ladies during the night accidentally smothered her child. She woke up and saw the still cold form of the baby and after she recovered from her shock, she noticed that her companion's little baby was still cooing and alive and she felt so guilty for her neglect. She gently went over and took the living baby and replaced it with the cold form of the dead baby. Her roommate woke up the next morning and was going to nurse the baby and saw that it was dead and began to cry and then realized, this isn't my baby. You know, when they're real little, it's sometimes hard. They all look like raisins when they're real little. <laughs> then they start to take on more characteristic. Well, the, there's a major dispute in that household because she said, this isn't mine. That's my baby. No, that's my baby. That's your baby. And the difficult cases were brought before the king. And so as this case was presented to the king, all of his counselors were gathered around to see how Solomon was going to revolve, resolve this uh, complicated problem. And he thought for a moment, Solomon was an expert of human nature, and he said, very simple, you say that the living baby is yours, and you say the living baby is yours, there's only one living baby, obviously we need to divide it. He called for his soldier who came over, gave the king a, a double take, are you serious? The king nodded, he pulled out his sword, held up the baby, got ready to whack the baby in two. As he was about to do it, one of the women said, no, please, give her the baby, spare the baby's life. And the other woman said, obviously, this is the only fair thing to do. Go ahead, cut it in half. <laughs> Solomon said, give the baby to the woman who is willing to sacrifice it rather than see it die. That's the mother. Now, we are going to try to make a decision tonight about how to find out the true woman. Revelation depicts two women. One is true, one is counterfeit. And like that soldier, we need to use the sword to be able to distinguish between the genuine and the imposter. The Bible tells us, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, that will need to be our guide tonight. So let's go to question number one of our lesson, dealing with this battle between the two women. Question number one, how does Revelation picture God's true church? Revelation 12, and you can read verses 1, 2, 5. It says, there was a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and upon her head a crown of twelve stars. And she being with child, cried, travailing in birth, and pain to be delivered. I want to read on a little further. And she brought forth a man-child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron, and her child was caught up to God and to his throne. Now, who is this woman? One thing we discover right off, you can tell who the women are in Revelation by what they wear. Clothing in the Bible is descriptive of character. This woman is wearing the sun. She's wearing light. She's standing on the moon. She's got a crown of stars above her head. She is wearing the light that God made. Now, when you read Revelation, it says the Lord made the sun, the moon, and the stars. There's all kinds of artificial light we've got here in this... Uh, auditorium and you watching around the world. But the light that God made is the sun, moon, and stars. God says to the church, 
I am the light of the world, and you are the light of the world. She's standing on the moon. That's a symbol of the light of the Old Testament that was reflecting the reality that would come when Jesus arrived in the New Testament. She's wearing the New Testament, the light of Christ, the Son of Righteousness who arises with healing in his wings, Malachi chapter 4. Got 12 stars above her head. Above the head represents authority in the Bible. Twelve apostles leading the church. In the Old Testament, you had the twelve patriarchs of Israel. You had the twelve judges that you find in the Old Testament. Twelve represents the leadership. So here you have a picture of God's church. The sun, the moon, the stars, there's light. And she's waiting to give birth to a baby. It says she's travailing, ready to give birth. Question number two. Who is the great red dragon and what does he try to do? Remember to say the answers out loud, even you at home, watching in your respective churches and here, here we go. And that great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan. So we know who the dragon is. Now the dragon, the devil, he doesn't usually plop down on the ground looking like a devil. He operates through existing powers, governments. You remember when the devil tried to destroy Jesus as a baby using the Roman power. What power? The Roman Empire he tried to use. It was Roman soldiers that went after the babies in Bethlehem. It was Roman soldiers that whipped Christ and Roman soldiers that crucified him and pierced his side. It was Roman soldiers that also helped persecute Paul and some of the early church and imprisoned them. And so the devil uses these political powers. Furthermore, it says, the dragon stood before the woman which was ready to be delivered for to devour her child as soon as it was born. Not only did the Roman soldiers go into Bethlehem to kill all the babies, the devil knew the Messiah was coming. He wanted to stop him in his infancy while he was weak and defenseless. But you know, I think if you look at the Old Testament, you'll also find out the devil did the same thing during the time of Moses. You remember when the Pharaoh knew a great deliverer was coming. The devil, he didn't know all things. The Bible wasn't written yet. Moses wrote the first five books. He was wondering if God would become a man during the time of the Exodus. He wanted to prevent it from happening. He had all the baby boys thrown to the crocodiles in the Nile River. But God, in the same way he delivered Moses, he delivered Christ. Now, I want to give you a very quick Bible study. Uh, this is not in your lesson, but I think you'll find it beneficial. It will help you understand a theme that goes from Revelation, no, Genesis, all the way to Revelation. There are seven miracle baby boys born in the Bible. Abraham's wife, Sarah, was barren. As a result of a miracle, she gave birth 90 years old to Isaac. Then Abraham's son, Isaac, married Rebekah. Rebekah was barren. Do you remember that? He prayed for her and she gave birth to twins. Be careful what you pray for. <laughs> then and she had Jacob and Esau. Then Jacob's wife, Rachel, was barren. He prayed and she had Joseph. Then you've got the story of Hannah, Elkanah's wife. As a result of very heartfelt prayer, she gave birth to Samuel and five others after that. Remember what I said, careful what you pray for. <laughs> then you have the Shunammite woman who was barren. Elisha prayed for her. She gave birth to this little boy. Then you've got John the Baptist. And the last one, the seventh miracle birth, was Jesus. Interesting. Each of these miracle baby boys were types of Christ. Isaac went up the mountain with his father as a willing sacrifice with the wood on his back, just like Jesus, right? Jacob, father of 12 boys, just as Christ had the 12 disciples. The patriarchs came from Jacob. The church, Israel, came out of Jacob. Then you've got Joseph, one of the most beautiful illustrations of Jesus in the whole Bible, sold by his own brothers for the price of a slave. They took his royal robe, they covered it with blood, just as they took away Christ's clothing that was covered with his blood. Yet he forgave his brothers and saved them from starvation, just as Jesus forgives us and saves us. Then you've got this Shunammite woman had a little boy. He was out working in the field with his father and he died. The harvest is great. Jesus says the world is the field. And he's resurrected just as Christ died working for the father in the field and was resurrected. Then of course you've got Samuel who was not only a prophet, he was a priest as Christ is our supreme prophet and high priest, right? Then you've got John the Baptist who is the friend of the bridegroom who began to introduce him 
to the world. So here you've got these miracle baby boys that were all forerunners of when Christ would be born. Now this woman represents the church, God's church. Some have said, and I don't mean to be disrespectful, that the woman here in Revelation 12 is Mary. Uh, you keep reading on, and it's not Mary. It says that she's given wings, and she's persecuted, and she flees into the wilderness, and it tells what happens afterward. What does a woman represent in prophecy? Church. I've likened the daughter of Zion unto a delicate and comely woman. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loves the church. John, when he wrote his letters, he said, from the elect... From your sister unto the elect lady. Uh, this language of a woman as a church is all through the Bible, and you can uh, see that very clearly. Question number three. What happens after Satan fails to destroy Jesus? It says, Revelation 12, verse 5, And her child was caught up unto God and to his throne. We know Christ ascended to heaven. Now, the devil did everything he could to vent his diabolical fury on Christ in person. But when Jesus ascended up to the Father, now how does the devil hurt Jesus? This is question number four. It says, after Jesus was caught up to heaven, what did Satan do to the church? Answer, Revelation 12, 13. When the dragon saw that he was cast to the earth, he persecuted the woman which brought forth the man-child. Now, we found out who the woman is. Is there any doubt about who the man-child is? Does everyone here know that that is Jesus? Okay, why does the devil persecute God's people? Well, because it's a very simple philosophy. When you want to hurt somebody, if you can't get to them, get to that which is precious to them. I know somebody got very angry at me one time, and I had a new minivan. They picked up a rock and threw it at my minivan. They knew that would hurt me, and it did. If you want to hurt a parent torture their children. The devil knows the best way to hurt God is by hurting his children. The Bible says that you and I are the apple of his eye. That means we have his special attention. The church, defective and feeble though it is, is the object on earth upon which God bestows his supreme regard. You and I are the salt that keeps this world from perishing. And so when the devil tortures and persecutes Christians, it grieves the Lord deeply. And that's why the devil wants to persecute the woman, the church. Let me give you a little history here. The devil's first plan in attacking the church was destroy it from the outside. For the first two or three hundred years of the Christian era, he sought to debilitate the church through just extermination. Christians were told if they did not make offerings and pray to the various Roman deities that they would be tortured, imprisoned, killed. You've heard the stories about how the Christians were thrown to the lions in the Colosseum. I even heard just uh, on the History Channel, I was watching about Rome last night. Some of you may have seen that. I like history. It was talking about how they would take the Christians and put them inside the skins, bloody skins of animals, and throw them in the arena to be torn apart by wild dogs. And Nero used to smear the bodies of Christians with pitch and ignite them to light his gardens at night. They used to tear them limb from limb with wild horses. You've heard the expression in English, wild horses couldn't keep me away. That's where that comes from. And so first he tried to get rid of them all by exterminating them. But the more they persecuted the Christians, the more the church grew. Because all these pagans in the Colosseum saw these Christians dying with peace and a calm and a serenity. And they thought, they've got something we don't have. And they'd go search out the Christians and say, why are you folks so happy? Why are you so content? Because the pagans were constantly living in fear, afraid of the gods and afraid of death. The Christians had peace, even in the face of death. There was a power that they had. And so the church continued to grow. One of the great church fathers said, the blood of the martyrs is seed for the gospel. It, it just sprouts up. It's like trying to get rid of weeds by mowing them, and they just keep growing. So the devil went to plan B. If he cannot... Destroy the church from the outside by annihilation, by genocide. Destroy them from the inside by erosion. Then along came Constantine, Constantine. I've heard it pronounced both ways. The Roman emperor, the great. And he legalized Christianity because he needed the support of the spreading Christian church to weld the empire together. There was a civil war during his days. It was a political move. He claimed before a battle that he had a vision. He was supposed to now fight under the sign of the cross. And he ordered his army to march through the Tiber River in Rome. And he said, now you're all Christians. 
all these Roman soldiers went down into the water, dry pagans, and they came up wet pagans. And they brought all this paganism into the church. And they said to their religious leaders, they said, well, you know, we've been told we're Christians now and I've got my gods. What am I supposed to do with all my idols? And the genuine Christians said, you can't pray to idols anymore. And they said, what? We don't want to be Christians. And then some of the Christians began to compromise. They said, look, you know, we can make a few compromises and think of all the pagans that will join the church. They'll stop persecuting us. It was a terrible mistake. But some of them who wanted to have influence with Constantine, who Constantine, incidentally, even though he professed Christianity, he continued to worship the Roman gods and Apollo right up until before his death. He was not baptized until he was gravely ill just before he died. Up to then it was a political move. And so they took all these statues they had throughout Rome of um, Jupiter and Apollo and Mercury and Zeus and Diana and they named them Peter, James, John, Paul and Mary. That's the truth. I know it sounds like I'm oversimplifying, but it's the truth. I have heard that the statue of St. Peter in St. Peter's Basilica in Rome existed before St. Peter was born. It used to be the statue of Jupiter in the temple of Jupiter, and it was moved. How many of you have heard that? Interesting. Change the name. Why do you think? You ever look at that stat statue? Peter's got a horn coming out of his head. Where does it say that in the Bible? If they were going to make a statue of Peter biblically, there should have been a foot in the mouth. Because Peter was always putting his foot in his mouth, if you read the New Testament. <laughs> Not a horn out of the head. <laughs> and so, all of a sudden, all this paganism came into the church, and the church became politically correct. But the genuine Christians who wanted to go by the Bible, they now became persona non gratis. They were persecuted. And once again, at this point, the Christians, the genuine Christians, were put in chains. Those who spoke against this popular religious political institution... They either were persecuted, put in prison, executed, or they had to flee up into the mountains. Number five, where did the women go during this terrifying period of persecution, and how long did it last? Answer number five, it says in Revelation 12, verse 6, And the woman fled into the wilderness, where she hath a place prepared of God, that they should feed her there a thousand two hundred and threescore days. Now, that period, 1,203 score days, that represents this time period where for 1,260 years, the church from 538 to 1798 had to flee into the wilderness. The church went underground. Don't you think it's interesting that in the Old Testament there was a wicked queen named Jezebel, a pagan queen, who married the king of Israel, the government, and she manipulated the king of Israel to persecute God's people like Elijah. And Elijah had to flee into the wilderness for 1,260 days, literal days, where he was fed by ravens and angels. Isn't that right? He fled into the wilderness. When God led the children of Israel out of slavery into the wilderness to save them from their persecutors, did he feed them in the wilderness? Are you aware that not only was there this time period during the Dark Ages when God's church fled into the wilderness and God fed them, but during the seven last plagues in the time of trouble, I believe that God will feed his people who then again must flee into the wilderness. Jesus said, when you see the abomination of desolation, stand in the holy place, let those that be in Judea flee into the mountains. Those in Sacramento, flee into the Sierras. Those in Manhattan, what's the nearest? Adirondacks. <laughs> Hey, you go World Trade Center, as close as they <laughs> You got a long, you're gonna be a traffic jam. But God promises that our bread and our water will be sure during that time. Amen. We may have to flee into the wilderness. He says, do not even go back for your jacket to your house. Now that time period was from 538. What happened in 538? Justinian, the Roman Emperor, made the Bishop of Rome, or what we call the Pope, the supreme ruler of the church. He gave him an army to correct heretics. In other words, to imprison and per persecute and kill those who did not cooperate with this new government institution. He made Rome the new capital for the church where it formerly had been in Jerusalem. Then in 1798, they had basically uninterrupted control from the ten divisions of the Roman Empire until 1798 when Berthier, Roman, uh, Napoleon's general rather, took the Pope captive. They received a deadly wound. They lost their power temporarily, but that wound has been healed since then. Now, question number six. We're trying to identify God's church, right? What are two other identifying marks for God's true church? 
Revelation 12, 17. And the dragon was wroth with the woman. What does wroth mean? Infuriated. And went to make, first of all, if you're in doubt about whether or not this is the right church, this ought to be the final clue. As soon as you know the devil's mad at her, she's doing something right. Amen? Amen. So this is the true church or the devil want to be mad at her. If you're not doing anything to make the devil mad, then you're not doing anything right. The Bible says all that live godly will suffer persecution. We've received some reports from some of our sites in Africa. The groups who are hearing these messages, did you know that some of the pastors have been imprisoned since we started this series because of what they're presenting to the people? Persecution already, right now, around the world, because of preaching the message. The dragon was wroth with the woman, and he goes to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus. God's people will have the testimony. That means the spirit of prophecy. You read Revelation 19, verse 10. The angel said, the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy, and the commandments of God is the law. The law and the prophets, the word of God, is how we're going to find who the true church is. Now, friends, I'm going to just be very honest with you tonight. We're going to talk about why there's so many churches and how do we discover the true church. I heard a story about a Russian gentleman. You know, Karen and I spent some time in Russia, and I remember shopping there, and the, the shelves were so sparse. One of our friends said, let me take you to the supermarket. And we went to their market, and there was like 12 items in their supermarket. And uh, they didn't look at all embarrassed. They said, hey, good, today we've got milk. <laughs> today there's cheese. You know, they were really struggling back then. Well, I heard a story about a Russian gentleman who immigrated to the U.S., and he became naturalized, and he said, you know, I want to fit in as much as possible. What do you Americans eat for breakfast in the morning? And his buddy said, well, we typically eat cereal. Okay, so he went to the nearest mega supermarket, and he said, uh, show me where your cereal is. I'd like to buy a box. And the supermarket attendant directed him to an aisle longer than an airport terminal. <laughs> and there on either side was this row and row and shelf and shelf of all different descriptions of cereal. And there was cereal for children, and there was health cereal, and there's cereal for old folks, and cereal with prizes inside, and and big boxes and little boxes, and uh, you just name it. There's just a thousand different types of cereal. And he just stood dazzled trying to know, how do I pick a box of cereal? And he was looking at the covers. So oh, this one's got a prize inside, and, and this one's got a cartoon on the cover, and this one's got cocoa bits in it. And uh, how do you pick it? So he threw a few boxes in and went home and was thoroughly disgusted because he did not read the ingredients. Some people pick their churches the same way they shop for tomato sauce. They just look at the outer label, but they don't read the ingredients. If you're going to make a decision about how to join a church, you must do it based upon what are the doctrines of the church? What do they teach? You'd be surprised how many people, you ask them, what does your church teach? They have no idea. My church, what do we believe? We believe just like my pastor. <laughs> well, what does your pastor believe? Well, he believes like I do. Well, what do you and your pastor believe? We believe the same thing. There's a lot of confusion out there. And so some people, they're going up and down the aisles just blindly looking at the, the cocoa puffs, looking at the cartoons on the cover, and they're not looking at the ingredients. Well, you must decide based on the ingredients. Now, there are good people and bad people in many different churches. Am I right? Would you like to know the main reason that people pick a church? Ten main reasons, approximately. It's the church close to my house. That's why they go. It's the church where my parents have always gone. What do they believe? I don't know, but we've always gone there. They think the pastor's good looking. We know that's not the criteria at this seminar, right? I know you're here because you love the word. I, I've got a mirror. <laughs> they like the music program. Now, do we all like a good music program? Is that the reason to join a church? No. They've got a good children's program. How many of us want to have a church with a good children's program, Mrs. Bachelor? Amen. But that's not the reason to join the church, is it? You know, some people pick the church because they like the structure. They say, I'm going to that church. Why? It's a beautiful building. What do they teach? Haven't the foggiest, but look at the label. 
pretty on the outside. Don't know what they believe. Some people pick a church because it's where all the influential people go. You know, I understand in Washington, D.C. that when President and Mrs. Clinton attend, attend their respective Baptist church, they get a much bigger attendance that Sunday because they want to be there with all the prestigious. Yes, uh, I was in church today with uh, Bill. <laughs> and I understand that the pastor of one of these churches gets phone calls all week long. They say, <clears throat> is the president going to be here? And the pastor says, well, I don't know, but the Lord's going to be here. We think that will demand a good attendance. <laughs> These are the reasons people pick a church. There's only one good reason to pick a church. You might go to a church where the people are a little crabby and cantankerous and they don't have a nice building and the choir sounds like feeding time at the zoo. But if, <laughs> if their foundational teachings are the teachings of Jesus, if they're building on the rock of Christ's word, that is God's church. Amen? Amen. And you're going to find good and bad people in every church. Am I right? So this is going to be our criteria as we try to discover. Now, I know what some of you are already thinking. I've let the cat out of the bag. I'm a Seventh-day Adventist. And uh, you're thinking, oh, Doug, you're obviously going to tell us that you think your church is the true church. Of course I do. <laughs> Otherwise, you'd be wondering, well, why don't you go to the other church if you don't think this is it, right? But I want you to make your decision the same way I did. I visited and studied with many different Christians, and I still preach and study in many different churches. But if I find a church somewhere that's closer to the Bible, that's where I'm going. I have no denominational allegiance to a creed. My allegiance is to Jesus Christ and His Word. It just so happens right now I've not found a movement that is closer to the Bible and prophetic fulfillment than the Seventh-day Adventist movement. I don't even like to call us a church. We're a movement that is sweeping the world, fastest growing Protestant church in the world today. And so there's a reason for that. I think it's a fulfillment of prophecy. We're getting back to the Bible. Question number seven. How did Jesus say that we demonstrate our love for Him? Answer, John 14, 15. He said, if you love me, keep my commandments. And 1 John 5, 3, for this is the love of God that we keep his commandments. And his commandments are not grievous. Now, there's a lot of churches that keep some of the commandments. Most churches keep nine. Some get up to eight. They got a problem with idolatry. But uh, is God looking for a church to keep some of them some of the time? You know, I've been in jail, not just to visit. Uh, you heard my testimony. Everybody I ever met in jail keeps God's commandments. Some of the time, some of them. Is this what the prophecy is talking about? That kind of inconsistency? Or is the Lord talking about a consistency like Deuteronomy 5, 29? Oh, that there was such a heart in them that they would fear me and keep all of my commandments always that it might be well with them and their children forever. That's the reason that it might be well with you and your children forever. All of them, always, a consistency in wanting to obey. That doesn't mean Christians in the true church don't sin, but they will at least admit their goal is to keep all of God's word and to obey him. Amen? Amen. Number eight. I, I did that one. Didn't I do that first, John? Five, three, yes, I did. Number eight. Okay, it's okay. You keep an eye on me, dear. She, I do miss some questions, and she's trying to make sure. Number eight. What three angelic messages will God's end time church be preaching? Now, when you read in Revelation 14, these three angels fly in the midst of heaven with a loud voice proclaiming these prominent messages just before Jesus comes. And in Revelation 14, after these three messages are given, it says here on one hand we have those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus, and then you've got here those who have the mark of the beast. You know why this message is important? Everybody here, everybody watching, in the near future, you are going to be married to one of those two women. You are going to either be part of God's bride, the true church, the light of the world, or you're going to be part of Babylon and her daughters. We need to know how to tell the difference. Those who are in the wrong army when Christ comes will be put out of service. They're going to be on the losing team, and it'll be the biggest tragedy of their lives. So it does make a difference what you belong to. You are accountable for what you belong to. Number eight. All right, I already read the question, didn't I? Revelation 14, 7. The first message is A, fear God and give glory to Him, for the hour of His judgment is come. Now it says that the hour of the judgment is come. We've learned we are living in the final, or the, 
the final days of the world's history, the first phase of the judgment that takes place before Christ returns. The second part of that is talking about and worship him that made heaven and earth and sea and the fountains of waters. We've learned as we studied Revelation, the issue revolves around who you worship. Remember Cain and Abel claimed to worship the same God. One did it according to God's dictates, according to God's command. One did his own thing. One killed the other. That's what's going to happen in the last days. We're going to either go by the word of God and do it biblically or we'll do what's politically correct but unbiblical and the wicked will persecute the righteous. It says, worship him that made the heaven and the earth and the sea. It's calling us back to the God who created and every Sabbath day is a memorial of his creative redeeming power. That's why that commandment does matter. Number B or letter B, Revelation 14, 8. And there followed another angel saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she made all nations drink the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Now, what is that wine of Babylon? You know, Christ gave a cup of wine, grape juice, unfermented to the disciples to seal the new covenant. doesn't say they got drunk. The wine that this woman drinks is fermented. It is putrefied. It is intoxicating. It represents the appealing false doctrines of devils that have intoxicated much of the Christian world. And, you know, we're getting near the end of the seminar, so there's no sense holding back at this point, friends. I need to be very plain with you. If you're part of a church that tells you you don't need to worry about keeping the Ten Commandments, that God doesn't care, you're in Babylon. That's a doctrine of devils. If you're part of a church that tells you that when you die, you go right to heaven or hell before the judgment day, before the resurrection, that's paganism. That's the wine of Babylon. If you're part of a church that says that you can baptize by pouring or sprinkling rather than as Christ was baptized, it's a doctrine of devils. It's some of the wine. These are some of the things that people have been intoxicated by, the false teachings. Some people think this prophecy about Babylon here, speaking that literal Babylon is going to be rebuilt. But we've learned already, opening night, Isaiah chapter 13 tells us, Babylon, the glory of the kingdoms, the beauty of the Chaldean excellency, will be as when God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. It will never be inhabited, neither shall it be dwelt in from generation to generation, neither shall the Arabian pitch his tent there, neither shall the shepherds make their fold there, but wild beasts of the desert shall lie there, and their houses will be full of doleful creatures, and owls shall dwell there, and satyrs shall dance there. It will never be rebuilt. So in Revelation, when it talks about Babylon being fallen, you know, there's churches that are waiting for Saddam Hussein to rebuild Babylon. That's not what it's talking about. Babylon represents fallen Christendom that persecuted God's people. Third angel says, answer C, followed them saying with a loud voice, if any man worship the beast and his image, we're giving part three on this message tomorrow night, or receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same will drink the wine of the wrath of God that is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. The most fearful curse in the Bible is pronounced on those who worship the beast and receive the mark of the beast. That's why we need to know that we are in the right fellowship. Number nine, to whom will God's church preach these messages? Something else we'll learn about God's church. Having the everlasting gospel to preach to them that dwell on the earth and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people. Never in the history of the world have the doors for the gospel been opened wider than they are right now. You know, when we went to India, pastors there were recommending we rent a hall that might seat three or five hundred people. And Amazing Facts went in and we said, let's get something that seats at least a thousand. We got a hall that seats sixteen hundred. And you could see that it was packed and they were sitting in the aisles. India has been one of the most difficult places in the world to preach the gospel. All of a sudden their hearts are open. They're hungering. They're tired. This openness is all over the world. And now, with the satellites and the, and the television and the radio and the printed page and cassette tapes, the gospel of the kingdom is going to the whole world. God's church is going to be a universal movement. It's not going to be just a local congregation. It's going to be an organization that is going to the world with structure. All right, question number 10. I'm sorry, what specifications has God given in his word to help us positively identify his end-time church? All right, we're going to narrow it down. We used some evidence when we tried to identify the beasts of Revelation 13. Now we're going to find out a little more about 
how do you identify God's church? First of all, answer A, it appears and does its visible work after it emerges from the wilderness. This is speaking of the remnant church, the last day church. Now, in 1798 is when the beast received a deadly wound. America's constitution was signed in 1776, but you may not know that we were not recognized as an independent nation until 1798 because we hadn't really shaken off the British battles were still raging, but they became independent, recognized as a sovereign nation in 1798. So the church is going to spring out of North America, this new life. You notice it says this second beast comes up out of the earth. It's not a densely populated area. Our pilgrim fathers principally came fleeing religious persecution. They were not trappers and pioneers as we like to think. Some of them came later. The first ones who landed on the shore were devout religious people who are looking for a place to practice the scriptures. Second evidence, answer B, the church will teach the same truths the apostles taught and all of its teachings will agree with the Bible. When Christ ascended to heaven, he had trained his church for three and a half years. He had poured out his Holy Spirit. He had a united body of believers that were biblical and clear. When he comes back again, he will have a similar body. Do you think the Lord is coming back? And he says, well, yeah, I realize that you're all scattered. I sort of failed, didn't I? I wanted you to be one. Christ's prayer in Revelation, I'm sorry, in John 17, was that the church would be one. He said, all men will know your, my disciples by your love for one another. And the unity, is the unity to be based on just a mushy feeling or unity in the word, in the truth, in Christ? We're to be united in our faith, not just united in hugging each other. Some people think, you let's put aside doctrine and just love each other. You're not to sacrifice principles of truth because Jesus is the truth. Amen. And when you sacrifice the truth, you injure him. The truth sets you free. It liberates us. Amen. Another characteristic, it will keep the Ten Commandments, all ten, including the Bible Sabbath on the seventh day. Amen? Amen? Some people think, well, what difference does it make? Friends, God has shown us that He means what He says. If you start saying that you can change one of the commandments of God, then nothing in the Bible will remain. Everything becomes fluid at that point. Answer D, it will have and believe the spirit of prophecy. It said that the testimony of Jesus, Revelation 19.10, is the spirit of prophecy. They'll not only preach and believe the law and the prophets, they'll not only have all the gifts of the spirit, they'll also have the gift of prophecy. Now, you know, before the Lord does anything significant, he raises up a prophet. Before the flood, he got a prophet to warn the world. Before the exodus, before the exile, there was Jeremiah. Before Jesus came the first time, John the Baptist, God speaks through people. God's remnant church will also have this gift of prophecy in their midst. Answer E, it will proclaim God's three end time messages with a loud voice to the whole world. And as Jesus said, friends, this day is this prophecy fulfilled in your ears. Right now, the message is going to the whole globe through satellite and through this program. And this is not the only program that's doing it. There's a lot of others that are preaching and proclaiming the message. You want to hear a little tidbit that I just think is great? You know, Amazing Facts has a website where you can get a lot of Bible truth in our booklets on our website. They've got these programs where you can surf the website for all kinds of information. This avid fisherman was wanting to find out more about better bait because he was having problem with his worms. Whenever he got them, they were dead, they didn't last. So he typed in worms in the internet, worms. And he came to a book that Amazing Facts has where Brother Joe Cruz, one of our founders, he wrote, The Worm That Does Not Die. And he thought, well, that's the kind of worms I need for my fishing. I need some worms, and my worms always, they die right away. So he got a hold of this book, and the book is talking about what happens when you die and the punishment of the wicked. And he thought, this is what I expected, but it's very interesting. He read through that, read through a bunch of the other material, went through some Bible studies, and got baptized. Looking for worms. He got hooked by the Lord. Amen? <laughs> that's a great story. Answer F. It's going to be a worldwide movement. Now, with all due respect, there are a lot of community fellowships springing up, and their doctrines are very nebulous and vague. You're not sure exactly what do you believe. They've got some primary things, and then everything else is sort of open, up for grabs. God's movement will be a worldwide organization. You know, anywhere I go in the world today, I think there's about 230 countries in the world today. The Seventh-day Adventist Church is now operating in about 220 of them. 
we are virtually in every country, every corner of the world. And you know the wonderful thing is, no matter where I go, they believe the same thing. There's a unity of faith. Let me tell you something. One of the things that convinced me about the Seventh-day Adventist Church, I was up in the cave visiting many different churches on Sunday when I began to study the things I'm sharing with you in the seminar. I said, Lord, I want you to show me the truth. I can't trust pastors. They're going to all do what I'm doing. They're going to say, join my church. I said, Lord, I want you to show me through the Bible. And that's the right answer. That's the right question. So I was praying and I discovered the Sabbath truth and all these things I'm sharing with you. And I found out what the Seventh-day Adventists believe. One day I was driving around. I now moved out of the cave. I had a job selling sandwiches. As I'm driving from Palm Springs to Riverside, there is an African-American gentleman walking down the road, blazing hot desert day. He's got a brown paper bag, and I stopped picking him up. He hopped in. He goes, praise the Lord. I said, oh, are you a Christian? He said, yeah. I said, so am I. He said, praise the Lord. <laughs> and so we drove along, and as we picked up steam, he says, do you go to church? I said, yeah. He said, what day do you go? I thought, that's interesting he's asking that. I said, well, I go Sunday, because I was at that time, even though I learned the Sabbath truth. He said, do you know what day the Sabbath is? I said, uh, yeah, Saturday. He said, praise the Lord. <laughs> and I said, I said, you're a Seventh-day Adventist. He said, a what? I said, you know, Seventh-day Adventist. No, I, don't, I haven't heard of him. Sorry, I can't help you. He and I began to study. And we got so involved, he was believing everything that I'd been presenting at the seminar here that I was letting my sandwiches de-thaw out there in the van. We went and sat down together and just began to study together. I said, where'd you get all this information? He said, it's in the Bible. The Lord impressed me with something that day I never forgot. Is that if you study your Bible, you'll come to these conclusions. It's in the Bible, friends. All right, so it's a worldwide movement. Answer G. It will teach the everlasting gospel, which is salvation through Jesus Christ alone. We are saved by grace through faith. We are not saved by keeping the Sabbath or any commandment. But we keep the Sabbath the same reason we keep any of the other commandments. Amen? Because we love the Lord because we are saved. Number 11. Jesus gives you these seven prophetic identifying points and then says, Go and find my church. What does he promise regarding your search? The promise is, if you seek, you will Fine. Friends, you've got to be willing to search. And where do we search? You search in the Word of God. You can search through prayer. But God's Spirit is never going to lead you contrary or contradict God's Word. Question number 12. How many church organizations in the world will fit these seven points that we've covered? The Bible says there is one Lord, one faith, one baptism. Now, some people don't like to hear this. And you've heard me say all along the way that I believe there are many Christians in many churches. Haven't I said that? I still believe that. But you know what, friends? Before Christ comes back, I've also told you there's going to be a shaking in Christendom and everybody's going to polarize in one of two camps. Right now, God has people everywhere. And some of these people think it doesn't matter what church you belong to. All rivers run to the ocean. All churches are going to get you to heaven. It's not true. I remember one time I was driving to Texas from California. Late at night, tried to go all night long, pulled off to get some gas, pulled back on the interstate, went for several miles feeling very secure. I was making progress. Then I noticed that the scenery looked familiar. Went a few more miles and I noticed it said Interstate 10 West. Well, Texas was East. But I said to myself, hey, I'm sincere. I don't need to turn around. Is that what I said? No, I'm never going to get to Texas going West. I had to turn around. Sincerity is not going to get you there. I was sincere, but when I learned I was going the wrong way, I turned around because I wasn't getting any closer to my destination, right? And so many people think as long as you just love the Lord, it doesn't matter what you believe. It does matter what you believe, friends, because you become like who and what you believe. You become like who you worship. Number 13, many denominations call themselves Christian. Does that make them God's true church? There's a prophecy here in Isaiah 4 that we would do well to consider. In that day, speaking of the last days, seven women, what does a woman represent? Seven women will take hold of one man. Who is that one son of man? That's Jesus. Saying, we'll eat our own bread. What's bread represent? Word of God. And we'll wear our own apparel. Clothing represents righteousness. Only let us be called by thy name to take away our reproach. What a fitting picture. 
got all these churches in the last days who say, we want your name because there's no other name given among men whereby we must be saved, but we're going to have our own private interpretation of the Bible. We're going to have our own concept of what constitutes righteousness, but we're going to call ourselves Christian. Boy, if ever a prophecy had come true, that prophecy is true today. Amen? Amen. There are a proliferation of churches that say they're Christian, but they're doing their own thing. God has a movement where he's calling people back to the foundation made on the rock, the words of Jesus Christ. Amen. Number 14. Once a person discovers God's true end-time church, is it necessary to become a member? Uh, I think so. The Bible says, And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. Now, the Bible says that the church is the body of Christ, and we each one are members individually. Now, turn to the person next to you. Go ahead, turn to the person. You at home, turn if there's anyone near. Do they have a nose? Does that scare you? If I were to point to someone and say, oh, look, a nose. That doesn't bother you, does it? But what if I say, look on the floor, a nose. Now, if, you, if I said I saw a nose or a finger or an arm on the floor, how many of you would be a little distracted by that? If I said, don't pay any attention to the nose that's sitting on the floor here, just we're going to keep on preaching, you'd be, oh, no, the nose on the floor. You know that it needs to be on a face, right? And some people think they can be part of the body of Christ and be amputated from the church. No, you don't live long. A finger, a nose, one of these extremities doesn't live long when it's taken away from the life. If you want to be alive, you need to be part of God's living church, the living body, amen? A baby that's born and placed out in the woods gets eaten by the wolves. Little lambs need to be in the fold. You need to be in a family. So we need to be part of a church. Number 15. How many ways of escape were there back in the days of Noah? Jesus said, as it was in the days of Noah, so also shall it be in the days of the Son of Man. It says, by faith, Noah prepared 26 arks. Is that what it says? No, it says prepared an ark, one, to the saving of his house. You know the story of Noah? He said, the end is coming, and there's one way of escape. God has warned me. And he pled with the people, but they mocked him. They said, all things continue as they were from the beginning. The end isn't coming. We have nothing to worry about. But God gave them abundant evidence that Noah was telling the truth. The sky turned dark with clouds of birds that suddenly came to the ark, and all of a sudden there was a rustling in the woods, and all these great beasts and small came and began to go, led by angels, into the ark. And then finally, after they all got onto the ark, Noah pled for the people to come inside. They said, well, you know, it's not raining yet. They wanted to wait until they saw the storm. But the Bible tells us that God called Noah and his family into the ark, and then he shut the door. And life went on as normal for seven more days after Noah and his family were safe and secure in the ark. Then the rain came. Then the floods descended. Then they all began to knock on the ark and say, no, we'd like to talk. <laughs> this is Avon, open up. Anything they could do to try and get them to open the door. But it was too late. The door had been shut then. Some people are going to wait until they see Jesus coming before they repent. You know, there's a sign out in front of a Baptist church. It said, repent now and avoid the rush. <laughs> because most people are going to wait until it's too late. But because Noah believed, he and his family, those that listened to God and took advantage of this ark of safety, were saved. And they had new life as a result of that because they trusted the Lord. Friends, God has an ark of safety and it's his church. It's a place where we come together, we learn his word, we learn to love each other, and we're preparing to be caught up when the Lord comes. Amen? Amen. I am not saying membership of a church is criteria for salvation. In other words, I am not saying, I do think it's important to be part of a church, that just because you're a member on the earth below, that your name automatically is written in the book of life. But it certainly is important to cast your vote on Christ's side. If Jesus walked the earth today, would you want to be part of his family? I believe the answer is yes. Number 16, since there are many faithful Christians in other churches, and since God only has one true remnant church, what is going to happen to these sincere Christians in other fellowships? John 10, verse 16, Other sheep I have, which are not of this fold, them also I must bring, and they will hear my voice. And there shall be 72, 530. No, no, no. One fold. You see what's going to happen when Christ comes back, friends? There's going to be one woman, one true fold, one shepherd. 
Revelation 18, verse 2 and verse 4. Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen. Come out of her, my people, that you be not partakers of her sins and that you receive not of her plagues. Now, friends, in the last days, God is calling us to come together based on his word, not based on a denomination or a club or some social structure. But we need to come together as a people who love the word of God. He is calling you. You are here by virtue of an appointment, a divine appointment God has designed. It's not an accident you've been hearing the truth. He is calling you to come to him. I'd like you to listen and pray about your decision to come into the ark of safety as John sings this familiar hymn. Softly and tenderly, Jesus is calling, calling for you and for me. See on the portals, he's waiting and watching. Watching for you and for me. Come home, come home. Ye who are weary, come home. Tenderly, Jesus is calling, calling, oh sinner, come home. Friends, I'd like to ask you, please take your envelopes tonight, whatever registration device you have at your registered sites, write your name on there, please. And I'd like to ask you some questions. Make sure when you leave the auditorium or your hall, please leave it with the ushers or the buckets or the baskets. But I want to give you an opportunity to listen to the Spirit's call. If tonight you understood the message and you believe that God has a church in the last days, put yes on line number one. If you believe that God has a church in these last days, a true church, put yes on line number one. Put yes on line number two. If you would like to be a member of that church, that might mean through baptism or rebaptism. You might do it through profession of faith. It's possible if you've been baptized biblically that you can join by virtue of your existing baptism. But if you want to be part of that fold, if you want to come into the ark of the people who will be one with Christ in his word when Jesus returns, put yes on line number two. I'd like to close the service today with a special prayer because I believe that titanic battles are raging in the hearts of many here, in the hearts of some of you who may be watching around the world, around the country. Please, everyone, bow your heads for just a moment. Here in Manhattan, those of you who might be watching at home, I'd like to pray for you. I'd like to talk to you for a moment. If the Spirit's been calling you and you are struggling to make a decision, God will not force you, but the devil cannot stop you. God has cast his vo vote for you when he sent Jesus. The devil has cast his vote against you and you have the tie-breaking vote, but you must make a decision. Don't be afraid, friends. You have everything to gain. Father in heaven, I pray that these souls who are struggling right now will make a choice. They will make a decision to come just like they are. Not to worry about how they will live the life tomorrow, but come today and you will give them power for tomorrow. We ask in Christ's name. Amen. I pray that many of you made that decision now to come to Jesus just as you are. Don't forget, we are going to be worshiping together this Sabbath day. Tomorrow morning, we're going to be studying very interesting principles about how you can live debt-free and prosper in the Lord. We'll find out from the Bible. You can bring your friends. We'll see you then. Leave your envelopes at the door, please.